So Johnny and I are so excited today. We have Michael Sorensen on, a marketing executive, personal development junkie, and best-selling author. And we love the book because we were talking about this earlier before we jumped in. This month's theme is emotional bids. We delve deeply into Dr. John Gottman's research on emotional bids. And the one thing that all of our fans have said is, okay, how do I apply this in my life? It's a phenomenal concept, but it's a little heady. It's a little difficult for us to actually work into our daily life. And that's why we really love the book because in the book, there are practical examples of how to use this with your coworkers, with your significant others and your friends so that we are taking this heady scientific concept of emotional bids and actually putting it into practice, which is so impactful. And I know Johnny and I were talking about this earlier yes. in our own lives. And we're excited to share the story of how you discovered emotional bids and this concept around validation, really allowing it to be something simple that we can put into our lives so that the people around us feel good. And I think all three of us had the, the common thought of learning about this and thinking, wow, this is a superpower right here. So the right. book is I Hear You, The Surprisingly Simple Skill Behind Extraordinary Relationships. I got to ask to start marketing executive, writing a book about emotional bids and validation. How did you get there? <laughs> Honestly, it's a funny story. Um, because I never, a lot of people ask me, oh, congrats on the book. You know, that was probably something you always wanted to do. And I'm like, no, like I never did I ever think I was going to write a book. I've never sought out to be an author. Um, but what happened is actually a number of years ago, I started seeing a therapist uh, to get some help working through a number of issues in my life. And uh, I quickly found out that I'm, I'm a huge proponent of therapy because I learned all sorts of valuable life skills that literally transformed every aspect of my life, from my dating, from my family relationships, to my management. I'm, I'm a manager of 20 or so people at work. Um, through, the, through, through meeting with this therapist, I came across a ton of valuable life skills. And one in particular stood out as being especially powerful. And that's that principle, that skill of validation, which, you know, thinking about your this month's theme, emotional bids, validation is what people are looking for when, when they're bidding, right? When they're at, when they're putting that bid out there, validation is what they're looking for. And so I started learning about this through therapy and started using it in all those aspects of my life. And it was, it was like Johnny said, like a superpower. Like I was able at work to take employees that were super ticked or frustrated and help calm them down. I was able to deal with family members who were having a hard time. And I, you know, even if I didn't have good experience or advice to give them, I was able to help them feel better. And then I was able to just connect better with people throughout my life. And so I had experience after experience after experience of this just working magic in my life. And I started talking to friends about it. And they're like, what's this you know, emotional bids, like validation? What are you talking about? And I'm like, I got to find a book. I got to find something, you know, that I can share with them. And there wasn't much out there. There's certain something. Certainly Gottman's work is powerful. But um, ultimately, the thought came to mind, well, you, you should write one. There's not something that, that puts it out there plainly and simply and and then, of course, my inner critic shot back. I was like, who are you to write a book, right? right. If you're not a therapist. You're not a psychologist, blah, blah, blah. But that thought persisted. And I honestly just felt like I, I've got to do this to just share the wealth. And, uh, and so I published it about a year ago. And it's now consistently a number one bestseller on Amazon in multiple categories. Uh, I get the messages, emails almost daily now from people across the world. Uh, it's, it's been humbling and exciting uh, because it is powerful, you know, this concept, these principles that you guys are talking about. I know Johnny and I are big proponents of therapy, but we have some listeners who are probably on the fence or even skeptical. Is there anything that you could say to our audience about the impact that therapy's had on your life? And I know obviously you were skeptical in the beginning. What helped you, you know, move to that next step? Because sometimes admitting that I need the therapy is the, the biggest step for people. It's like, well, that's for someone else. I don't need that. I'm not sure it could help me. Sure, sure. Well, first off, I think it's I think they're right to be skeptical because you get the wrong therapist and they can mess you up, right? right. So you, you have to get the right person. And I, for me, it was just asking around, right? I had some people that had met with this woman and really swore by her. Uh, as far as do I need it, do I not? I mean, obviously, that's a, that's a personal question. Everyone has to look at it. Um, I've got a close friend of mine, though, who I think put it perfectly. He's he's very much like the manly man, like, you know, the leather jacket, like the last guy I think that you would expect to talk about emotions and things like that and feelings. Uh, but he started seeing a therapist and he came to me and he's like, he's like, bro, like I tell everyone I got to get a therapist. He's like, we take our cars in for oil change and regular maintenance. Like we do all kinds of preventative stuff on everything around the house, but we don't do anything for our minds, you know, and we, we just expect our brains to just work perfectly from birth to death. 
and and we don't get any help just kind of clearing out the clutter and i love that because that's that's what therapy was and is for me it's just an outside perspective to say oh you know have you thought about this have you approached it this way and uh you know it's it's awesome <laughs> clutter is is one way of going about it and i also see it as as the older you get you're just taking on sustained damage and it's continually building up and <clears throat> and that needs to be straightened out i mean it's and i don't think people understand just how much susceptible you are to taking on damage from so many different directions even uh, from the media, from things that your friends say. Like I, I was just uh, I was reading your book earlier today, just thinking about some of the earlier moments in childhood of hearing something that forced me to go inward and, and understanding how long I, it took to get back outside. I was thinking of a friend who, as I was excited about something earlier in life, I think I was just getting into my teenage years, 13, 14 years old, just getting to those, those, those friendships where everyone's starting to become a little bit self-aware and I was excited about something. I think it was about uh, something about a band coming to town or possibly maybe have been myself playing a show for the first time as a teenager. And I remember one of the other guys in my peer group looking at me and saying, You've gotten so your head has gotten so big since you've gotten the disband, and I remember being so terrified of that because I didn't want to be that sort of person who's walking around uh, being smug and and because of that it instantly shut me down, and it took. I remember thinking about how much that invalidation, or that SWAT had it. it, it kept me for a while to open up again about things that I was excited about. And of course, you know, when you're reading something such as your book, it helps you go back and start to look for all those places where you've taken on some damage. So you can look to see if, was there anything warranted there? Or was that just me being unsure of myself and get taking that hit? I, I love that. And of course, as we grow old, we collect friends and we have family members and sometimes family members can even be toxic. Oh. I wrote an article about how to remove toxic people. It's one of the, the most frequently emailed questions I get is how do I actually do this? So you, you have that component of toxicity, but then you also tend to surround yourself with like-minded people. So if you hold on to these ideas, they're not being interrogated. You're not being asked, well, why are you still worried about that, Johnny? Whereas therapy offers that moment where a third party asks you mm -hmm. plainly to explain to them why you feel or think that. And all of a sudden you go, wait a second, I don't even know. Or you know what? That is preposterous. But yeah. our friends certainly aren't doing it. And a lot of times yeah. our families don't even have the tools. And that's what we love about the book because as we start talking about validation, we're gonna get into this a little bit deeper. It's practical. It's something that you can apply at every level. And you start the book beautifully talking about how this has helped with your dating life, but also with managing others. So can you speak a little bit to how emotional bids and Dr. Gottman's research has helped you in the workplace? Because I think that's the one for a lot of us, we probably think the least when we think emotional bids. <laughs> sure, sure. And, and I'm happy you asked that because that is one of the, I, I preach that almost more than the relationship side of things. I mean, at the end of the day, they're all relationships, right? That I think that's that's the key point here is, you're right, it's not just for romantic relationships. If you're interacting with another human being, they are making emotional bids and they're looking for validation in some form or another. Um, I, I use it all the time at work. In fact, one of the most pertinent examples to me is, I had a, a coworker who, uh, we kind of have a history together of having very long-winded conversations where if he's concerned about something, he'll come into my office, and I'm not even exaggerating here, two hours sometimes for, for concerns that he has. And, and I would talk, we'd talk in circles and I'd try so hard to say, hey, we got it covered, don't worry about it. So, so he comes into my office one day and he's upset that I've assigned um, another coworker to a project. And he says, Michael, you know, I just gotta tell you I'm concerned. I don't feel like this guy's qualified for this project, you know, and I'm afraid that he's gonna mess some things up here. And I did like most people do and I just said, hey, you know what? Don't worry about it. You know, he's going to do fine. It's all going to work out. And, you know, if we pause for a second and look, his bid was, hey, see me here. Like, I'm nervous. And all I did was shoot it down and say, don't be nervous. You're OK. Right. Which is very invalidating. It's turning away from his bid. Um, and sure enough, he just came right back with another punch. Well, I don't know about this. You know, well, well, did you do this? And honestly, it almost started to get personal because I said, look, I've got this cover. And he said, well, honestly, Michael, I 
I don't know if I can say this, but I question whether or not you know what you're doing. And I was like, well, okay, take a step back here. You know, my mind, like, I'm like, okay, calm down. But I realized in that moment, hold on, I'm, I'm approaching this wrong, right? I, I can I can play this for two hours like it always does, but I had just <laughs> met with my therapist not a week earlier and we are talking about validation and I'm like, okay, here's a chance to try this. So what I did is I, I, I paused for a second and I just listened to what he was telling me, right? I tried to kind of get in his shoes and go, okay, you know what? He's worried about this. I, it actually makes sense why he's worried because he doesn't have the, the whole picture. And so I told him that. I said, okay, you know what? Uh, I actually appreciate the fact that you're concerned about this. Like, you, all you see is me assigning this guy this project. You don't feel like he has enough of the credentials, you know, enough qualification, and you're worried that he's going to, you know, damage our brand. And literally, he did, gives this big sigh and goes, yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. And then he kind of leaned back, and I was like, oh, we're making progress here. <laughs> right. You know? And so just that validation, finally he felt heard. And he was able to put some walls down. And so we talked a little bit. And after I had validated him, I still didn't agree with him, but I was able to still validate him. And then I said, you know what? I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate you keeping an eye out for our brand. I think you're missing some information. Can I share, you know, the full picture? And he said, yeah, definitely. And so I explained the situation to him. And literally in 15, 20 minutes, he felt good about it. I felt good about it. And he's out my door. And I remember leaning back in my chair and I was like, I just got back an hour and 45 minutes of my life here. Like I was, I was gearing up for another two hour thing here. Um, but it's powerful in, in, in management because you're going to have disagreements. You're going to have people who are frustrated or upset and they're looking for validation. They're looking for, to see that you understand them. And as a manager, as a coworker, um, it's, it's powerful when you know how to respond that way. I love that. And I, I think you're right in the fact to focus on these things at work because they're where the easy, quick wins are going to happen first because you're there every day. You have an opportunity to work through these and maybe a little bit of a safer environment that perhaps with your romantic relationship where, you know, maybe you're not so willing to try some new things to work through. But once you start getting those victories at work, you start seeing the relationships grow and strengthen, then perhaps it's going to be a lot easier to take them to the and misses or the misses. To follow up on that, when you think about it, all these other relationships in our life where there could be conflict, well, you can move away from your family. Mm -hmm. You don't have to pick up the phone if your parents call and you're in conflict. You're a significant other. You could break up. You can move out. But work, we often feel trapped with our coworkers because maybe our career doesn't have that opening to move to. I need that paycheck. I need to make things work. And if you have a toxic work environment where you're in conflict with other people, you don't have these tools, it can really wear you down. Well, and, and who doesn't want to save more time at work? Yeah, that's right? the other and, thing, right? You AJ, gotta, <laughs> if you pick up my emotional bids, you wouldn't have to deal with me for that. That explains extra why I'm working so hard. <laughs> <laughs> so We've talked a lot about emotional bids. I would just love to hear in your words what emotional bids are for the audience. Sure. So, uh, so an emotional bid, as, as Dr. Gottman pointed out, is basically any request for connection. And, and they're so subtle oftentimes, which is what makes it difficult for some people to pick up on. But it's anybody coming to you to share something, right? So, so if I come to you, AJ, and I'm like, dude, you'll never guess what happened at work, right? That's a bid. I'm, I'm wanting you to go, well, what happened? You know, tell me about it, right? Or if I come to you and I'm excited and I'm like, oh my gosh, this, this, this amazing thing happened. It could be all the way down to, I love the example you guys gave in your last podcast of, oh my gosh, look, a purple parakeet. Like it's just pointing something out there. That's a request for connection. It, it's, it's me wanting you to recognize me, to validate, you know, to kind of affirm, oh yeah, that is cool. Or, oh, that's awesome. Or, oh my gosh, I can't believe he said that to you at work. It's a request for connection. Right. And when we talk about validation now, how would you define validation for the audience? I see validation as really the, the, the desired response, if you will, to, to uh, an emotional bid. So validation is in essence saying, I hear you, like I, I understand where you're coming from and it makes sense that you feel that way. And, and that's an important distinction. A lot of people, when they hear the word validation, if they're familiar with it at all, they assume it means agreeing with exactly. the other person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's not the case. And that, that's an important point to note that you can validate someone even if you don't agree with them, right? So to go back to my example with a coworker, I didn't agree, you know, I, I firmly believe that it was the right move to assign that person that project, but I was still able to validate him. I was still able to see that he was worried that he was, you know, X, Y, and Z. And so I was able to validate him and say, you know what? I get it. <laughs> I, I understand why you're frustrated. I, I, I would feel the same way if I were in your shoes. And because I meant that, he felt validated. And then I was still able to uh, to share my perspective. So validation is just saying, oh my gosh, 
I hear where you're coming from, and that makes total sense. It's, and to go along with that, I think a lot of people t- tend to get worried about any point where they're validating anything because, as you mentioned, of not wanting to agree for fear of becoming the nice guy or the nice girl where all of a sudden if they've heard that a few times in their life they've swung the pendulum to the other side and as we know everything becomes an opportunity to try to either negate or to be sassy with the person that they're meeting for the first time which obviously if it's a first time meeting it's jarring and it's on it's it's more repulsion than attraction absolutely and I think validation is, it's a lot simpler than people make it out to be. I think that's the beauty of it. When you, when you hear validation, you're like, how am I going to do this? This is, sounds like heavy lifting to me. But it, it really is being an empathic listener, understanding the emotional context of what we're dealing with, and allowing that person to feel that emotion, right? When we talk about negating, we talk about, uh, turning away from the bid, we're basically saying you can't feel that way around me or you shouldn't feel that way. And we're projecting our own emotions and thoughts on the other person in the moment when they absolutely don't want that projection. Right. Well, and, and, and I, I appreciate what you're saying, not negating, because honestly, as we're talking, I think about if you want a shortcut to validate, just don't offer advice and yeah. don't try to make someone feel better. Like that's the number one mistake I think we all make. I literally did it last week with my girlfriend. I I wrote a book on this stuff. You think it should be like second nature, but she comes to me and she's all frustrated about something. And I immediately jump in with solution. Well, have you done this? You should do that. And I, and that sure enough, she starts pulling her walls up. Well, yeah, I did that, but la 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 la. And she starts going and I'm like, Oh, oh, red flag, you know, (laughs) sorry, I was supposed to validate you. Right. And so if I didn't give advice and if I just said, Oh my gosh, that sucks. Like suddenly, that's all she wanted. Well, she didn't need advice. So funny as I was flipping through the yeah. book, uh, I'm reading Amy's conversation. I'm dating Amy, and oh. I'm like, <laughs> I feel like I'm David. I'm I'm just going through, and I'm like, ah. And countless times in our relationship, after I've given what I think is this amazing advice, it's worked for me. I know it's the solution that will unlock uh, whatever conflict that she's having. Days, weeks after, she's like, I don't want advice. I just want to be heard. I'm like, well, I heard and I gave you great advice. You, you <laughs> got bonus. the bonus. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I usually charge for this. This is amazing. And she's like, absolutely not. That's not what I wanted. So you, and in relationships, we've all had those moments where she's like, you're not listening. He's like, you don't hear me. Well, that's what we're talking about here by this validation. It's not listening to the facts. And a lot of us have a career where we want to be a problem solver. We get paid to solve problems yes. for the company. We get compensated. We get promoted because we solve problems. Relationships don't work that way. Well, I think we, we all like to think and feel that we can think our way through things and, and fix it. It's, it's part of our, our, our aptitude and all the work that we do to get better with things. And so of course we want to think our way through and see how we can solve the problem. And what happens in that moment is you're taking the spotlight off the other person and putting it right on you. Yes. There you go. Because let me be the therapist. Let me be the PhD. I'm going to step in and I'm going to show you the way. It's the (laughs) last thing that someone wants to hear. Right. Well, and, and honestly, so one of the last experiences I had that kind of pushed me over the edge to write the book, is I was uh, my, my brother called me and he was going through a tough time and you know I thought okay I'm gonna validate him I'm gonna validate him and uh, and so he starts talking and I oh, I have the perfect solution right that comes to mind I'm like oh my gosh I told him how to fix this but then I thought no mm-hmm. I'm gonna wait and I'm gonna ask if he wants my opinion so I validate him and then I go you know what I, and I ask him I say okay so what, what what are you gonna do about it and he goes well honestly I'm gonna do da 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 and he just said exactly what I was about to offer as advice and so I just said, I think that's awesome. You know, and he's like, oh, thanks so much, man. Like I feel so much better and we hang up. So more often than not, people already know how to solve their problem. Yeah. They're, they, they just want you to connect with them. They want you to feel the weight of the situation if it is a problem or they want you to feel excited about it if, if they're excited about it. And oftentimes just leave it at, just leave it at that. But I, I do love that then asking, okay, is now a good time for my advice? Yeah. Is now a good time for my opinion? Are you willing to hear me out instead of just going straight into your opinion and, <laughs> yeah. and your advice? And, well, Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Well, and that also with it, I mean, to, to ask them, and what is your plan? That's, that's fantastic, because if they don't have one, well, may I offer and suggest you one? Right. And, 
instead of just coming in, dismissing whatever they were planning to do anyways and saying, you know what, I have the answer. Yeah, and, and it can be super casual, right? It's just like, oh my gosh, that's crazy. Uh, I have a couple thoughts on it. Do you want to hear them? You know, and, and, and most people will say, yeah, sure. And even if they already had stuff in mind, they're suddenly much more receptive to your idea, whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. The fact that you've shown enough respect to say, hey, I'm not just going to assume that you can't fix this and I know what I'm doing. The fact that you've shown that respect and said, hey, you know, do you want my opinion on it? That goes a long way in right. keeping it a strong emotional connection. The other example that I love from the book was the father son example, because I, I feel like either we are parents or we've been on the other end of that, where as a kid, we had something devastating to us. We didn't perform in the big game when we really wanted to and everything was on the line. And we've all had that. Well, better luck next time or don't worry about it. But internally, you're like, I am worried about it. I let my teammates <laughs> down. We lost the game. What are you talking about, Dad? So this also relates to our listeners who have children, understanding that the validation of children is very important. Absolutely. I, I talk a little, little bit about that in the book that, you know, all, all of this, the emotional bids right, that you guys talk about and validation all centers around emotion, right? We're, we're all human. So we're going to feel emotion whether we like it or not. And we're going to feel quote unquote good emotions and bad emotions. But even just labeling it like that is what has really caused a lot of the problems in today's society, right? We're taught from an early age as children that there are certain emotions that are good and certain emotions that are bad, right? It's okay to feel happy and excited. Um, it's not okay to feel angry or bored or frustrated. And so as parents raising children, emotions are especially scary to young children, especially when they're, they're big, scary emotions like fear or anger, right? And so right. The, the, uh, the natural response for any parent when a kid comes up and is all scared is to go, oh, don't be scared, you're gonna be fine. Right. And the message that we as the parents send the child is you shouldn't feel that way. So then the kid goes, oh, OK, well, but I am scared, you know, but don't be scared. Right. Or I am angry. Well, don't be angry. And, and that teaches the child to then push it inward. Whereas, you know, if, if the child's scared, a more validating response would be like, oh, my gosh, that is scary, isn't it? You know, put yourself in the little five year old mind. Of course, that's terrifying. Right. I'm, you know, some mythical example here. But if you can look at your kids and go. Yeah, I, you know, I miss mom. Yeah, I miss her too. You know, it's so fun when she's around, isn't it? Yeah, it works like a superpower. If your kid is bawling frantic, you know, it doesn't just turn it off. But I can tell you from personal experience, it's amazing what validation does from if you're 85 all the way down to five and years old. Just saying, exactly. yeah, it makes total sense why you're feeling what you're feeling. The opposite is, is just as damaging, right? When you invalidate and you label these emotions as negative, then people hide the depression and it can get to a place where they're near suicidal or they do commit suicide because they have no one to turn to with these quote unquote negative emotions. So as parents, it's important to validate, allow them to work through the emotions because that creates healthy mental mindsets. Well, to even go along with that, not only have we labeled certain emotions bad, we've also tagged a name to them so that if you feel them, then you are this thing. Right. So now that's a, that's a, double whammy of the So you can't diffuse from them. No. Right. And, and emotions, when you bury them, they just fester, right? At least negative ones. Yeah, quote unquote negative. See, there you go. I did it, right? But <laughs> you bury those, you can't process them. And validation, you know, people who want to process them, they, they, they say that or they show you that by offering these emotional bids that we're talking about, right? They say something, even if it's just like, oh, I'm so, I'm so frustrated. And they leave it there. Well, that's, that's them saying, can you ask me about this? You know, can, can I share a little more about it? Because I want to I wanna let it go. And if you validate them, if you hold back from the advice, if you say, oh my gosh, you know, I'm so sorry, that's gotta be so tough. That allows them to start to process those, those tough emotions. Now, you say there's two core components to effective validation. Can we unpack those a little bit more for the audience? Absolutely. Uh, the two parts of it are one, identifying an emotion and two, offering some sort of justification or validation for that emotion. And, and that sounds very technical, right? So it could be if you go by the book, oh my gosh, you know, we could be talk, talking a lot about frustration, but oh, I would be just as frustrated, right? That right there satisfies both parts of it because yep. you, you know you're feeling the same frustration they are, so that's, ju that's justification, right? They look at you going, okay, well, he feels it too, therefore I'm not crazy. Uh, that, that's as simple as it is. Identifying an emotion and offering justification. If they're excited, being excited, that justifies how they're feeling. Right. And I'm just thinking back to all the moments where I've had that invalidation. 
and it is incredibly frustrating. It does make those, emo- you hold on to those emotions longer. You can't process them. They're not an outlet and they do fester. Well, think about it as a child. If you're feeling any of the negative emotions, your dad's going to tell you to grow up and, and stop feeling that way. And your mom's going to go, oh, I totally understand why you feel that. It's like, I'm going to go hang out with mom. Right. <laughs> <laughs> totally. She's also going to give me cookies. So <laughs> Now, I do like, this idea around not accepting or having to agree with it, but allowing the validation happen. But a lot of people, when they hear that, they feel that it makes them inauthentic. And it can be difficult to feel authentic when maybe you're not feeling those emotions, but you want to validate someone. So how do you unpack that to keep your authenticity? Sure. Uh, you're, you're spot on. It, it needs to feel authentic, right? So that's one thing a few people have asked me is, well, isn't this kind of manip- manipulative, right? I mean, you're just trying to make people feel a certain way. Absolutely not. People can see right through when you're not connecting with them, when you don't feel what they're feeling. Uh, and so it is trickier to validate someone if you don't agree at all and you can't even get in their shoes. And so in the book, I give a few a few tips on how to feel empathy for the other person if you're struggling with it. Uh, in fact, going back to talking about children, one of the the most effective, it sounds a little weird, but it's imagining the other person as a young child. So um, if I take this coworker that we've been talking about, you know, he's in his late 30s. um, It's, you know, if he's upset or whatever, my initial reaction is, come on, man, get over it. But if suddenly I imagine a little upset five-year-old, I'm a little less inclined to just say, come on, man, get over it. I can at least go, okay, you know, he's trying, he's doing his best, or he's scared, he's upset. And so if if you can get in the other person's shoes in that way, there's a few other examples of just trying to understand from their limited perspective how they're feeling. Then it, then it gives you at least enough connection to go, okay, I, I totally understand why you're frustrated, right? If, if from your perspective, you think that I'm just barging on in here and taking over control, of course, that'd be frustrating. That right there is validating. And then I can go, right. you know, so can I can I share with you my perspective? Well, and also putting yourself in the position of, of putting your, well, being putting yourself on the line, but not having all the facts of what's going on. Of course you would feel frustrated. Of course you would feel fear. Those blanks, pieces need to be filled in in order for you to feel okay of moving forward even if it is new territory yeah and again i I keep thinking about all these moments in my life and i'm like oh maybe i do need some therapy for some of this stuff (laughs) based on how many times i've been invalidated in these moments and when you're on the other end of it and you feel fully heard you feel that your emotions were at least understood in their place of feeling that frustration, I can understand how that's frustrating. Man, that alleviates a lot of the stress that goes along with relating to one another. I'll, I'll tell you what, um, one of the most powerful, um, it's actually text messages what it was that I've received about this book is a close friend of mine who read the book on a whim because she's my friend. And we ended up having a three hour conversation on the phone because she said, um, she said that when she was younger, she went through a very traumatic experience and all of her family completely invalidated her. her. Her dad was so, so scared and didn't know how to handle a situation that, you know, he, again, he was doing his best, but he just said, it's fine. You know, it's over. It's in the past. Don't think about it. And so of course it just drove it all down inside. And she is in her late twenties now. And I think that was 10 years ago and it's still affecting every part of her life. And so she said that when she read the book, she said, oh my gosh, that's what happened. My, my my dad invalidated me. All my nobody validated me, and so I haven't talked about it with anybody. That's what I need. And so we started talking. You know, I'm I'm no therapist, but I I care about her. And we started talking, and she said that it completely opened up like her her soul, her heart, when she was able to go back to that situation in her mind and go, oh my gosh, of course I should have felt that way. It was crazy, right? And and I was able to validate her, and it was amazing to see the healing that started to happen when we were able to go back and revisit it. And there are a lot of moments in our lives where we haven't been in the other person's shoes. And the big one is loss of a family member, loss of someone dear to them. And those are difficult moments, right? You wanna be there for your friend, you wanna support them, but you can't say, I know how you feel because you haven't gone through it. So the other thing that the book points out that I love is the honesty component of it. So you don't have to be inauthentic and be like, oh, I totally understand how you're feeling when you haven't been through that level of loss, you haven't gotten that bad medical news, 
So let's unpack that a little bit more for the audience, because I do feel we are so big on being honest as unlocking that authenticity. And in those moments where we're nervous what to say, you know, we can usually say the wrong thing and end up doing more damage. Sure. <laughs> well, you know, the, the very first story in my book, as you'll, as you'll remember, is I was actually on a date with a woman who, um, you know, when I first met her, she was bubbly and friendly. And I thought, oh, this is great. You know, let's go grab some ice cream. So we get together and uh, she's got total emotional walls up. Like I'm asking her questions and she's like one word answer. No. Yeah. You know, she's kind of looking at the clock and I'm like, what the heck? Like, did I miss something here? Like, right. she's clearly not wanting to be here. And I, I don't know, like I wasn't taking it personally, but so we talked for like 10, 15 minutes and finally I was like, oh, okay, I'm just going to take you back. You know, like yeah, this is fun, but you know, whatever. So we're in the car and we start driving and I ask her another question about her family. And then she pauses for a second and there's kind of, she has this energy of, oh, that's a touchy subject. And then on my mind, I thought, oh, okay, you know, maybe this isn't about me, maybe there's something here. And she says, well, actually my parents are in the middle of a divorce. And I said, you know, and then that moment, so my, I have not dealt with divorce, so I couldn't relate, but I could clearly tell she was going through a tough time. And so I said, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. And she goes, it's okay, it's fine. You know, kind of shuts off there because I think she was bracing for advice or bracing for however other people have invalidated her in the past. And, and so I saw that as an opportunity to validate her. And I said, uh, no, that's not okay. That's not fine. That's gotta be incredibly hard. And she said, actually, yeah, it really sucks. And then she just started to open up. And we talked for like an hour and a half. And, and what, one of the first things I said after she had you know, started to kind of divulge this information is I said, look, I, I'm going to be honest, I haven't dealt with that. You know, I haven't gone through divorce. So I, I can only imagine, though, the pain that you're feeling and, you know, the despair and the uncertainty. And again, that just like the floodgates opened, you know, and, and, and it was powerful to your point, AJ. I think it was more powerful the fact that I was just acknowledged the fact that I didn't know but that I respected the fact that she was going through a tough time. Right. I can't even imagine. It's such a powerful phrase when someone is feeling such raw emotions and our first instinct is to comfort them. But we don't have the tools to comfort people in those moments, especially if we haven't experienced them. And the worst thing that you can do is try to be inauthentic. And they're just like, well, you ha get out of here. I remember when mm -hmm. I lost my dad. There were so many moments where I grew so frustrated with people because I was being invalidated and everyone was trying to pretend as if they've been through it, they suffered and they tried to emote in a way that was inauthentic. So right. allowing yourself to say, I can't even imagine this, but recognizing the emotion and the frustration and, and the anger and all of those negative thoughts that they're working through can really allow the person a safer space to share and open up more. And going back to that superpower, I mean, these are the conversations that go on for hours. These are the conversations that create lasting relationships, friendships that allow people in your life to feel supported by you. Absolutely. It's, it's powerful. And, and, you know, I think few things are as invalidating as saying, oh, my gosh, I know exactly how you feel. Right. Because very rarely. In fact, I argue you never really know exactly right. how someone else <laughs> it's, it, I mean, if you, if you think you do, it's fine to say, oh my gosh, I went through something similar. And, and you, know, you can share that as part of your validation as long as you return the conversation back to them at the right. end. Right? One thing I mentioned in the book is you don't, you have to be careful to not go, oh my gosh, the same thing happened to me last weekend, exactly. blah, 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 blah. And you start talking and suddenly <laughs> the conversation's all about me. Right? And they're like, oh, that's, that's great. So it's fine if you want to share something, but definitely avoid, I know exactly how you feel. Keep it more, I've been through something similar. And then it, once you finish sharing, return it back to them. And there's a lot of ways you can do that. Oftentimes it's just saying, you know, if I share my story about how it was tough losing my dad, I might go back and say, it's, it's super, super hard, isn't it? You know, and then it gives you a chance to respond and keep talking. And I feel like in my life, I've had number of moments where I've met other people who've lost parents and it is kind of your first instinct, right? You've come out the other side, you feel like, you, okay, now I have my moment to really emote and really connect with this person. And it's so easy to take that exit ramp to, okay, now we're gonna talk about AJ and AJ alone and really devastate the other person in that moment where they really need comfort. Right, it's, it's easy to jump into advice, right? Because suddenly you say, well, I've been there, I can help you. And again, all of this is from good intention, right? Of course you wanna help your friend. Yeah. But again, the point that we argue in the book and the point you guys are arguing with the emotional bid discussions this month is, they don't always want advice, right? They'll, they'll come to you if they want advice. Right now they've just come to you wanting validation. Right now they've just come to you with a bid. And so if you, if you wanna say, dude, 
I went through a similar thing. My dad passed away, you know, five years ago and you leave it at that. Now they at least know that you understand, but you leave it there. And then if they want advice, then they'll say, so, so what did you do? How did you deal with it? Right. Then, then you can jump in with that advice, right? Well, it's, I think it's important to remember that everyone processes information uniquely to, to them. So there, there's no way other than sharing that experience, you've, you've taking it in in a completely different way. You're, you're not going to be able to exactly know how that person feels. So in order for you to do that, you're going to need to allow them to talk about it on their terms and through their process and their experiences. And I will say that in my experience, in the moment where the emotional bid is happening is the moment where people are least likely to want advice. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, in those moments where we're offering up advice are far different than, hey, I need your help with this, where they're actively coming to us for the advice. And it's very easy to fall into that trap. Are there other big misconceptions people have around validating and connecting with others in your experience? Sure. The biggest one is definitely well, I can't validate if I don't agree. Um, a couple others that I talk in the book, uh, one is, well, validation is only for negative emotions, right? So we've talked a lot about difficult conversations. Yeah. I think this ties it back in nicely to, you know, the first episode you guys had, the toolbox episode, talking about emotional bids. Um, people come to you just as often with something exciting that they want validation on. And so I talk in the book about um, how to give validation when it's tough, right? When these difficult conversations like we've talked about, but it is just as important to give positive validation. And, and there's, of course, the Gottman research that talks about that. Um, there have been other studies done that talk that, that demonstrate the importance of responding positively to someone's bid for connection there. And you would think that that would be such a, a much easier thing to do, but it's just as easily for, as forgotten as validating the negative emotions. I mean, we do it all the time. It's yeah, so true. It's we're so true. Always, and we talk a lot about this. You have the reference to the iPhone study in the book. We're always so focused inward now with technology and the access to our own story and what's going on in our own lives that oftentimes we miss these positive moments, even if they're small in other people's lives and we don't celebrate them and we don't, uh, as Dr. Gottman talks about with spouses and, and being in a relationship with someone, in those moments where you're turning towards each other to celebrate the small win, the small victory in the other person's life, that really creates a solid connection. It's big. Um, in fact, as we're talking about, the, the very experience that led me to Gottman's research, uh, I think is funny. I won't take too much time on it, but um, I, again, I was with a girl that I was dating and we were out walking around and I had something super exciting happen in life, in, in my life that day. And so I was explaining the story to her and I was like all animated, you know, moving my hands around. Like, oh, this was so cool. And I'm talking for like, I don't know, two to three minutes or whatever, explaining this to her. And I finish and she looks over at me and she says, cool. And that was it. Like, and she had a smile on her face. Like she, she clearly listened to everything that was going on. But I remember looking at her and I was like, that's it. Like, surely you're going to say something else. You know, that's not, can't just be where you leave it, you know, but, and then she, and then she looked at me seeing that expression on my face and said, what? Like, like, what, what, what more do you want? And I was like, I don't know what I want, but I want something. Like, I, I was hoping that you'd get excited about me here or something. And so that was ultimately where I went back home and I was like, what then? I start scrolling through Facebook and then I come across an article that cites Dr. Gottman's research. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, I wanted validation. I wanted her to respond positively and to share in my excitement. You know, it goes with an experience that I had in my 20s. It was the only time that I had seen a therapist was in my 20s. And I, there was two that I had seen and one had moved away. So I had to, I went to her recommended, uh, substitute and the first therapist that I had, I really enjoyed her. She validated everything. And I only know this after reading this today was like, this is why. And so <clears throat> I, when she had moved away, I went to the next lady who was, it was going to be my therapist and we didn't click at all. And I just didn't like her and in fact I had quit after a few sessions and I was just telling the story in Chicago but to me I just felt like as I unleashed as I just started speaking she just sat there judging me that's like how I <laughs> it was how I felt however it did I don't really remember doing anything that felt 
judging. It was just that she didn't say anything after I unloaded. There was no validation, good or bad, for anything that I had said. So I'm, and then of course, after or saying all this, I'm looking for anything and I didn't get it. So of course, I immediately jumped to, she's just judging me. <laughs> right. <laughs> and in, in terms of therapy, we could see how much damage that did. I'm still scarred <laughs> from it to this day. Now, is there a point where there's too much validation for your own good? I know we kind of talked about this a little bit earlier. A lot of our audience is worried about being too nice and being walked all over and being too agreeable. And in that situation, we're, we're so cautious of being too nice that we miss out on the moments to validate. So in your mind, is there too much validation possible? You know, I like that question because my, my short answer is no, I don't think there is. But validation, I, I call it a skill because that's what it is. I really I like to call it a tool, right? It's fitting. We talk about toolbox, but it's a tool to be used. But tools work often best when you have other tools and other things to help. And so I think you've got to pair that with boundaries, right? You, and that's probably a topic for a whole other podcast. But of course, you've got to be able to set some boundaries. You've got to be able to um, to to speak up. You know, you, you've got to be able to say, hey, I would love to talk about this. Um, I am distracted with work right now. Can we talk later tonight? I mean, there's certainly a need for boundaries to kind of structure those connections. Right. But but by and large, I, I don't think that inherently you can validate too much. I just think you have to be careful. You, know, you have to learn how to stick up for yourself and to set expectations. I completely agree with the boundaries issue. I think that's that's the the backbone of of where all those things sit of of going too far or going being too agreeable. Now. We are all about practical advice and we've delved deeply into emotional bids and validation, this concept, but you have this amazing four step process. I'd love for you to walk us through so that our listeners can take this validation concept and put it into practice and start achieving these results. Sure. Sure. Uh, the four step method, as I call it in the book, cause I couldn't think of a better way to say it. You know, I don't love it, but it works. Um, it's just something that I tried to distill it down to actionable items, right? Something that you could do. So I looked at literally thousands of conversations um, in my own, you know, the five years or so that I was working through therapy, other guys that I was working with, um, and I distilled it down to really these four steps, if you will, um, and you can use them loosely. But I'll, I'll go over them high level, and then we, we can dive into them uh, if you want. So the first step is to listen empathically, right? Both of you guys have already talked about that. You got to hear what they're sh what they're sharing, and you got to understand. You got to feel what they're feeling. So you have to have that empathy there. So listen empathically, then validate the emotion like we've been talking about. Then the third step is to offer advice or feedback if it's appropriate. So when I say appropriate, you either need to ask permission to give advice or it won't be appropriate because they're sharing an exciting thing about them. And then it feels weird to go, dude, that's so cool. Do you want my <laughs> advice? Um, so third step is to uh, offer feedback or advice. And then the fourth is to validate again which sounds kind of like, oh, that's a nice fourth step, but it's it's big, right? If someone's sharing something with you to first listen empathically, then validate the emotion, then get feedback or advice, and then wrap it all up with validation at the end to just say, hey, you know what, thanks for coming in here and sharing that, I appreciate that, I, I know that's tough. That that helps round out the experience and, and close off that connection really well. And oftentimes in those moments, it's easy to miss the first validation for the other person. Because they're just like, I got to get this off my chest. I, I've been holding on to this. It's pent up. And the second validation, as you said, not only wraps it up nicely, but it really reinforces for the other person that I was heard and on Absolutely. a level that is meaningful to them. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and this this method, again, it sounds complicated, especially over podcast, but you can go through it in 30 seconds, right? It's like you can listen in five seconds. You can go, oh, my gosh, I can't believe you said that. You know, and then you can ask if they want your advice and they say no and you do good luck with that, man. That's tough. Like, you know, it can happen that quickly. Right. Uh, but but if you want to really dive into it and really refine that skill of validation, that those four steps, I find, uh, kind of boil it down. And let's refine the skill for the audience. So as they're working on this, they're going out and applying this. How can we know whether we've effectively validated someone or not? Are there signals you're looking for? to allow you to feel like, okay, now I know I'm improving, my validation's getting better. Absolutely. You're gonna know it's working if they continue to open up to you, if they continue to share. Uh, the clearer example is when it's not working, they're gonna get defensive, they're gonna just kinda shut down and like, oh, no, don't worry about it, they're gonna close off. And, and if they close off, if they get defensive, if they go, well, I know, but I, I know, but I know, but, then you're not validating them, you're invalidating <laughs> them, and you gotta take a step back and go, okay, am, 
Do I feel what they're feeling? And have I showed them that I feel what they're feeling? And are there daily habits or rituals that you use to reinforce this skill, to strengthen the skill set in your own life? Sure. I mean, truthfully, it's trial and error, right? I mean, that's where a lot of it's come from. Yeah. I told you that just last week, I jumped straight to advice with my girlfriend. So I am far from perfect. I don't know if I'll ever be perfect. And so just having the awareness around it, I think, is, is a big part. Um, one of the other tips that I talk about in the book is it is important to learn to recognize emotion. And I find that a lot of us uh, have a hard time recognizing our own emotions. Again, we talked about how a lot of that's invalidated in our society, right? Don't feel this way, don't feel that way. And so I've have found it valuable just myself to kind of check in with myself for once in a while and go, how am I feeling right now? You know, and, and probably say, oh, I'm good. But push a little deeper. What, what does good mean? Because good isn't an emotion. That's just how I'm labeling the emotion. So I go, well, I'm, I'm happy, right? That's an emotion. Or I'm ticked off at my coworker. That's an emotion, right? So the better you can get at recognizing your own emotions, naturally, you're going to become more empathic to the people around you. And we love journaling here as yes. a practice. I know our audience, if you haven't bought a journal already, you probably stopped listening. I find that if you can journal not only about your own thoughts and emotions, but the people that matter to you, the people's relationships that you're investing in. So take a tally, pay attention to their emotions. I'm more in tune with Amy's emotions now than before. It's so easy to, you know, get lost in social media and my own emotions. So I, I find that the daily journal practice, the gratitude journal, talking about what you're grateful for, and then just doing a survey of the people in your life and their emotional state will allow you to pay closer attention in these moments. This is a bit of a personal question for you. Uh, I get this a lot from Amy. You teach about emotional bids. How are you so bad at this? <laughs> is there an answer that you have that can help validate her and her frustration with me? I would say AJ's human. <laughs> We're all human, right? I can understand it, it, how you're frustrated with me, Amy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's funny, though, because it just is, you know. And I think at the end of the day, that's all anybody can expect from people is to keep working on it, right? And anybody listening to this podcast clearly is wanting to get better at their relationships, to get better at their communication skills. And so uh, I would hope that, Amy, I have not talked with AJ in a time when he's invalidated me, but uh, it would be frustrating if you're coming to him with a complaint and all he's doing is trying to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for putting a good word in for me with Amy. I appreciate it. But I like him. Obviously, she likes you. <laughs> What's the best place for our audience to find the book and find more information around validation? Books available on Amazon. It's paperback, Kindle, audiobook, however you like to listen to it. Um, it's called I Hear You, a surprisingly simple skill behind extraordinary relationships. And uh, you can reach out to me directly, Michael at IHearYouBook.com or find me on LinkedIn. Awesome. Well, thank um, you so much, Michael. This was great, Johnny. Yes, thank you very much. It's, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for the time, guys. Absolutely. 